think one of the reasons that I was invited to come talk to you all is because I did do my undergrad degree here at UT Austin. In fact, I was sitting in one of those very seats, probably um, these actual very seats. They don't look um, like they've been replaced in a while. I think I saw um, Rocky Horror Picture Show in this theater. I don't know if they're still showing them anymore. But, um, <coughs> What I thought I'd do is talk to you a little bit about my path, and I want to kind of illustrate my path from sitting in those seats to being up here. And you might think, well, that, that path is not very long, so maybe this whole thing won't take a whole hour. But what I want to illustrate to you is my scientific path, so how I got from a freshman undergrad um, and how I uh, had a path that wasn't necessarily a linear path from um, my educational background to where I am now as an instructor. And so what I have is a short timeline here. I realize many of you were not born at this point. <laughs> so um, this is right around the time I was getting my PhD. So after I did my undergrad degree here at UT, I went to Rice and got a PhD. And a lot of really exciting things were happening in stem cell research and regenerative medicine. So my degrees are all in chemical engineering, and my background is all um, polymer science, material science, and biomaterials. And so what I want to illustrate to you is I came from one area of expertise, and I was influenced very much by what happened to me at the time I was getting my PhD. So one of the first things that had happened um, when I was still in my graduate education is something that was in the news media a lot, and that was Dolly the Sheep. So Dolly the Sheep was cloned. Dolly the Sheep was cloned in Scotland. It was cloned using a process called somatic cell nuclear transplant, where one would take the nucleus, the forming cell mass, in a developing embryo from one organism and implant that into another um, uh, blastocyst, and that would then grow into a colony. So this is something that really caught on in the media and people really thought that this was interesting because it was the first big mammal to be cloned. Another uh, landmark study was what's called the Vacanti mouse. And this was all over the media because it's such a bizarre looking thing. It was a, an ear on the back of a mouse. So what they did was they took a, a child's, uh, they cast a child's ear into a piece of polymer. This polymer was a degradable polymer. It's like degradable sutures. Um, if you've had sutures put in that dissolve over time in the body. So they made this ear-shaped material that would degrade. They seeded it with calf chondrocytes, so cartilage cells from a young cow they put those cells on this degradable material and they implanted it into a mouse that didn't have an immune system. So this is an immunocompromised mouse. It can't reject foreign material. And they had this ear grow up inside a mouse. And it was not functional, but it certainly uh, was tissue that was in the shape of an ear. And that was something that really was uh, interesting for people. In 98, um, uh, a guy named Jamie Thompson at the University of Wisconsin uh, was the first to report culture of human embryonic stem cells. So stem cells that were derived from a human embryo. And that was certainly a landmark um, study that wound him up on the cover of Time magazine. And in 99, um, there was another landmark study where they looked at stem cells from an adult organism. So stem cells can be derived from bone tissue, from fat tissue, and from other tissues in the adult human. And they can be differentiated towards cell types that comprise different tissues. So bone tissue, fat tissue, cartilage tissue. And meanwhile, in the middle of all this is me. <laughs> so I really wasn't in this field at that time. I was learning how to do biomaterial science. And this is something that I went on to work in industry looking at materials, so medical materials and materials that make up medical products. And what I realized is that what I really wanted to do is I wanted to work in regenerative medicine and I wanted to work with stem cells. So I actually went uh, back and did a research associateship in academia uh, up at the University of Minnesota, so it was quite cold up there. And one of the things that I was interested 
interested in is stem cells and how they are cultured and what uses they have. And so, if you look at stem cells, there are many different types of stem cells. Um, stem cells are defined by their ability to replicate themselves, to grow and make more of themselves, and their ability to differentiate into tissue cells, so to become <coughs> cells of functional tissues, so to become liver cells, brain cells, heart cells. They are also defined by their potency. So embryonic stem cells that are totipotent can become all the cells of the embryo, plus everything that's outside the embryo, placenta and umbilical cord and all of the associated tissues. Pluripotent cells are like embryonic stem cells, they can become all the cells of the embryo. Multipotent cells can become many cell types of the embryo, but not all. And unipotent cells can only become one cell type. So I'm going to talk about pluripotent cells, and I'm going to talk about multipotent cells. These are the cells that we work with in my lab. Embryonic stem cells are derived from a developing embryo. They are derived from the blastocyst stage. This is a developing blastocyst. And what you see is that cells divide and divide, and then they begin to form a fluid-filled sphere um, surrounded by this trophoblast, which will become trophectoderm, and this inner cell mass. This is about 30 to 34 cells, and it's from this mass that embryonic stem cells are derived. So scientists will physically take out this mass and then culture it in a dish. So one of the things that happened when I went to collaborate with some folks at the Stem Cell Institute at the University of Minnesota is that um, there were a number of publications that had been called in question. And so stem cell research is a very competitive field and there's a lot of temptation for researchers to um, take shortcuts and uh, commit uh, scientific misconduct. And so what I want to illustrate here, this is a list of the 10 most highly cited papers in stem cell research. And two of them I already mentioned. One is the 99 paper that described the differentiation of, of multipotent cells from the adult. The second one is the uh, Jamie Thompson paper that describes the culture of human embryonic stem cells. There's a couple papers, so paper three, four, and seven, that are about induced pluripotent stem cells, those are relatively recent. The other papers are about cancer stem cells, so I'm actually going to get rid of those. So we have these two that I talked about, some IPS cell papers, and two other papers, these two papers. So one is by uh, the lead author, Jay, and one is by the lead author, Orlick. And both of these papers have had problems with scientific misconduct. The first paper, the John paper, was retracted from blood, uh, the, actually from Nature, I'm sorry, from Nature magazine. And the second, while well, not retracted, was uh, invalidated in subsequent literature. So in general, stem cell research is fraught with reproducibility problems, not just because it's a very competitive field, but also because some of these cells are very difficult to work with. They are very, um, sort of very sensitive to culture conditions and small perturbations in experimental technique. So the first clue in the Jang paper was that people weren't reproducing their data. And in fact, in many stem cell papers that have problems, the first clue is that people can't reproduce that data. Um, so not just in the Jang paper, but an earlier paper uh, by Maria Reyes um, in Blood, in the journal Blood, uh, and what I want to sort of illustrate to you, you might think, well, you know, how come the reviewers of these manuscripts weren't more careful? How come people didn't notice? How come, um, you know, scientists got away with this kind of misconduct? Well, once reproducibility problems were identified, um, editors at the magazine New Scientist looked at the data in the earlier paper, the Marina Reyes paper, and identified an error a willful misconduct event in this series of figures. Okay. Can anybody see what the problem is? Any 
anybody see where the misconduct lies? <coughs> No, it would be really, really hard, even for somebody that worked in this field, that knew this data, to figure out where it is. And I'll tell you where it is. This is a, a Western blot, so this is a protein analysis tool. They're looking at collagen type 2 and panel B under different conditions. If you look super carefully, what you will notice is that this blot has been flipped and turned upside down. And it's now this blot designating beta actin. So somebody, an editor, went through very carefully and looked at each piece of data to identify the errors that had occurred. Okay. What was interesting to me is I knew this lab. I worked with this lab. I knew the authors. And what I will tell you is that they were not evil. I think it's easy to look at this kind of misconduct and say, these were bad people. These were generally good people. They generally did good science, but they took shortcuts and they did things uh, willfully incorrectly. But it was really a lesson for me that, you know, you really have to be vigilant about the science and make sure that you're not um, taking shortcuts. And so it's not just public humiliation that's a problem. But also, um, the second paper I talked about, the Ehrlich paper, was refuted in um, Nature. And a clinical trial that was initiated based on science that was in that paper failed. So it wasn't a situation where somebody made an error and nobody really got hurt. People really got hurt as a result of this scientific misconduct. So that was something that really impacted my path and really made me think about how to conduct science in an um, appropriate way and in a principled way. And so one of the things that kind of kept me in the field, kept me going when I was thinking about stem cell research, is that stem cells have an unbelievable ability to differentiate, to become different tissues in the body, and to potentially be replacement tissues in the body. So pluripotent cells, like embryonic stem cells that one might isolate from those blastocysts, so taking out the inner cell mass, can be cultured in a dish and can differentiate towards all different types of cells, liver cells, blood cells, intestinal cells. So the three features that we would use to characterize pluripotent cells are, first, that they're able to differentiate into cell types from all three germ layers. Second, that they have the ability to develop into an embryo, interact with other cells, and become a chimera. A chimera is a term for an organism that has cells and tissues from multiple different genetic backgrounds. So if I have a developing blastocyst, I can inject stem cells, stem cells that are pluripotent, into this developing blastocyst. These cells and these cells will combine to make this hybrid organism. Okay, so if I take cells from here and cells from here and I look at them, they will be genetically different. And there's a great example on the internet. Uh, have you, any of you seen this cat, Venus the cat? Raise your hand if you've seen this guy. Okay, this cat is a naturally occurring chimera. So if I take cells from this part of the cat and I take cells from this part of the cat and I look at them, they are from genetically distinct organisms that have been fused together as a developing embryo. And in fact, human beings can develop as chimeras. So there are examples of spontaneous chimeras uh, in humans. So this kind of event can tell you what the potential is for embryonic stem cells. There's a lot of potential for developing new tissues and regenerating uh, disease tissues. But one of the risks associated with embryonic stem cells is, in fact, the third measure that we use for assessing pluripotent stem cells. So the third measure is that these cells are able to form teratomas. So if I take stem cells, embryonic stem cells, and not, I inject them into a wild-type mouse, they will form teratomas. This example of a teratoma. So this is a tumor that has developed cells, tissues from all three germ layers. So you may be able to see this is a tooth, this is some hair, this is some fat, 
And so you can imagine if one were to implant embryonic stem cells in a human and form this kind of tumor, this would be a horrible result. So this is something that we really want to avoid. So with the benefits, the potential benefits of stem cells also come great risks for disease. So this is an example of some work in my lab. So this is a culture of mouse embryonic stem cells. And what we've done is we've cultured these cells under conditions that promote uh, cardiac differentiation. So these cells are becoming heart cells. And we know because they will begin to spontaneously beat in culture. So you'll be culturing your cells, and all of a sudden you look at the microscope and you see this kind of uh, uh, sort of event, which is, uh, again, illustrates sort of the potential of these cells. But something else you'll notice about this culture is that it's very irregular. Um, they'll be beating in this area, and it will conduct through this node, but there may be no beating over in this area. So it's very irregular, it's very uncontrolled. So we really want to develop strategies to try to control and understand uh, stem cell differentiation. So in my lab, what we think about is we think about biomaterials. And uh, one of the reasons I'm very interested in biomaterials is that when I think about a cell in a tissue, it's not just sitting by itself or sitting with a bunch of other cells, it's sitting within a matrix, the extracellular matrix. So this is the proteins and glycoproteins and polysaccharides that lie outside the cell, right here. And when designing biomaterials, one wants to keep that in mind, that there is a matrix, an insoluble matrix, upon which the cells sit. So this is something I've been working on in my lab since I arrived here at UT. Um, this is an extracellular matrix type material. So it looks like this. It's kind of a hydrogel, uh, looks kind of like jello. It's made from fibrin. So fibrin is the matrix material that makes a clot or a scab. It's the structural element that makes a scab. And we modify it with a synthetic polymer, polyethylene glycol. So it's got a natural protein component, and it's also got a synthetic component. And what that does is that allows us to have good controllability over the physical properties of this material. So it's a fibrous material, and we use it to either embed cells or culture cells on top or deliver growth factors. And so this is an example of cell culture on the PEG fiber material, the engineered material. And so uh, this is a video of a fluorescent molecule that has been loaded within embryonic stem cells. They've been induced to form cardiac cells, the cells in the heart. These cells are sitting on top of regular tissue culture plastic, how we would normally culture cells in a petri dish. These cells are sitting on top of peg fibrin. And what I want to illustrate, everything else is the same. These cells, I hope you can appreciate, they beat in an irregular way. They are uncoordinated, so you'll see one uh, cluster beat and another cluster beat separately, whereas these cells are very coordinated in their beating and their beating is much more rapid, as you would expect for the mouse. So materials, the matrix, where the cell sits is very important in defining what the cell will do. And in general, it's not just pluripotent cells that care what matrix they're on, adult cells also care. And in fact, adult cells uh, exhibit this phenomenon of plasticity. So exposure to different environments can dictate what the cell does. So if I take stem cells from bone marrow, from a patient's bone marrow, and I put them in skeletal muscle or liver, they're going to behave very differently. They're going to know what environment they're in, and they're going to change their phenotype as a result. And the best example of that is the hen's tooth. So this experiment was done many years ago. This is a classic experiment in biology, and it's the formation of a hen's tooth. Um, if you look in the Wicked Dictionary, a hen's, hen's teeth are defined as an example of a non-existent phenomenon, as birds do not have teeth. So compared to horse feathers, which don't exist, and when pigs lie, which doesn't happen. But in fact, hen's teeth have been made. So what scientists did is they took jaw epithelium, the cells that line the jaw that would in a mammal, in a uh, mammal-bearing teeth, um, form the teeth, 
and they put that in combination with uh, mouse and mesenchyme. So mouse, mice, horn, teeth, and the mesenchyme that came in contact with that epithelium actually caused that epithelium to make a tooth. So this structure here that has enamel and dentin, this is made from cells from a chicken. But it was cultured in an environment that gave rise to that phenomenon. So it really inspired me to think about how new tissues could develop based on an environment. So, you know, feathers are modified hairs. Can I actually make horse feathers? Can I make wings on a pig? Just by driving cells in a particular direction. It's this kind of inspiration that led people to look at stem cell therapy to treat ischemic disease. And that's really what I'm interested in. So ischemic disease is when blood flow is uh, halted, is arrested to tissue. So the classic example is in the heart. The coronary vasculature, the blood vessels that feed the heart, in particular the left anterior descending, can become occluded in a clot following this uh, cardiovascular disease, and this tissue can die off. And as that tissue dies off, this can lead to loss of function in the heart and subsequent um, congestive heart failure and death. And this is something that we don't really have the ability to reverse. So we don't really have the ability to heal myocardium. So there's this idea that cells from the mesenchyme, so cells from bone marrow or from fat or from some other source in an individual can be isolated and then put into the heart following an ischemic event and cause healing to happen through some mechanism. Maybe it's causing blood vessels to regrow or maybe it's uh, encouraging cells to migrate in. Um, but there have been a number of clinical trials to evaluate this in humans, both in the United States and in Europe. And as I put this list together, it sort of made me sad because it's roughly in chronologic order. And the way clinical trials are done is they often have an acronym. So the first trial here is the MAGIC trial. MAGIC stands for myoblast something something ischemic cardiomyopathy. Okay? MAGIC. In that tells you the hope of every person involved with that trial. The patients, the physicians, the scientists. And as we sort of go down the list, what you see is they're not going to do magic, they're going to repair. They're going to repair the heart. Maybe we're not going to repair the heart, maybe we're just going to boost heart function. Or maybe we really need to focus in and think about what we're doing. And at the end, it's just a sad, sad group of numbers and letters. Okay? And that really tells you what happened in the clinic with these trials. So most of these trials had modest improvements. This is a scientific word for lower than expected, right? And so the repair and the boost trial had something in the neighborhood of 5 to 6% improvement in ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is a measure of how well the heart's working. Um, the MAGIC trial was not in fact MAGIC and ended up only showing about 5% again improvement in ejection fraction and this actually was halted, the study was awarded. <coughs> So when I was looking at some of these trials and sort of starting my academic career, what I began to think about is we're taking cells from bone marrow from fat from an individual and we're putting them back into the heart. What if we could cause, through some mechanism, those cells to just go to the heart and do what they needed to do? And so that's what we started to think about. Um, in a bone marrow transplant, Bone marrow itself is not actually transplanted, so they don't take out bone marrow and put it into another individual. They cause bone marrow cells to go in the bloodstream, collect them, and then they put them back in the bloodstream. And those cells will then go to bone marrow and engraft in that bone marrow. And the molecule that controls that process is this, SDF1 alpha, strong derived factor alpha. So this actually signals cells to go to a location. This is a chemokine. This is an attractive molecule for cells. And so what we proposed to do is we took our pet fiber, the same material that we had been working with. Because we have a synthetic mo molecule, polyethylene glycol, we actually bound, chemically bound, a growth factor, SDF1, to 
to this molecule and we put it together within our matrix material. And what we demonstrated is that we could control release, we could slow down the release of this growth factor so we could have it over a longer period of time. So we released uh, this growth factor over days to weeks. And what we demonstrated is that in a mouse model of myocardial infarction, so we gave mice little tiny heart attacks. So we ligated the left anterior descending and robbed that piece of tissue of oxygen. And we injected our material through a syringe uh, into this location. And we evaluated at one week, two weeks, and four weeks what had happened. So first we looked at what cells arrived in the, the location. And what we saw is that with our release system at two and four weeks, we saw a significantly greater amount of stem cells, secant cells, which is a type of stem cell, arriving in the heart. And what that led to was at four weeks, a significant improvement in fraction shortening, percent fraction shortening, which is a measure of heart function, and ejection fraction. So we got about a 10% improvement in ejection fraction over uh, the no treatment, this blue control measure. So if you think about what happened in the clinical trial, they were seeing maybe 5% improvement. We've maybe doubled that. But still, a normal ejection fraction would be about 55%. So we're, we're not back to normal even at four weeks out in this model. <laughs> and in fact, one of the things that we began to look at was we began to look at healing in other organisms. So other organisms have a much greater propensity to regenerate than humans. Humans actually have a really poor regenerative response. And so this is an example of salamanders, which um, do have a very strong regenerative response. And so what you can see in this video is that this is a salamander who's had its limb amputated. And over a period of time, this takes about 40 days, it will completely regenerate its limbs. And this can be done repeatedly, so it's a reproducible phenomenon. And people know something about how it happens. So this is sort of a diagram of how it happens. There's a bunch of tissue in that limb. There's bone, muscle, skin. When it's amputated, the animal bleeds. It re-epithelializes. So epithelial cells grow over the stump, which is what would happen in a human. But something different happens here in this animal that doesn't happen in a human. And that is all this bone and muscle and skin actually de-differentiates, which means that it uh, turns into something that's not bone and muscle and skin. It actually turns into a stem cell-like cell. So it goes back to its sort of embryonic origins, becomes a stem cell, proliferates, and then grows up and differentiates back again to bone, muscle, skin, and the cells that comprise that tissue. So for us, we, um, we know and, and we, we appreciate that humans don't do this. And one of the things that really drove this home to me is that we started collaborating with the US Army Institute for Surgical Research. So this is in San Antonio. This is in the Brook Army Medical Center. And if you've never been to the Center for the Intrepid or seen some of the amputees that are coming back from conflicts, it is, it is really um, heart-wrenching, and it really impacted me and how I think about what I want to do. Um, so it, it really makes, makes me think about why regeneration is so poor in humans and what, again, we can do to try to uh, combat that. So we turned our attention towards skeletal muscle, so lower limb uh, ischemia. Lower limb ischemia, um, just like heart disease, peripheral arterial disease uh, can cause a blockage of the blood vessels that feed the lower limbs. And that can cause um, loss of flow and cell death and ultimately amputation of the limb. There are also transient ischemic conditions like tourniquets. So tourniquets are often used in military battlefields. So if one has an injury that's causing blood loss, um, tourniquets can be used to stop that blood loss, but also it robs the rest of the tissue of blood, and so you get additional damage that can lead to things like compartment syndrome and reperfusion injury. So these two combined are big problems, both in the military and civilian populations. 
So, so again, we used our same material, and instead of SDF that we had used in the heart, we used IGF. So IGF is insulin-like growth factor. It has a lot of good effects in skeletal muscle. It can do things like stimulate um, mesenchymal stem cell recruitment. It can stimulate proliferation of myoblasts of muscle cells. It can promote differentiation of satellite cells. That, those are the stem cells in muscle and it can improve survival of infected cells. So what we thought we were doing is we thought we were doing the same thing with IGF that we did with SDF and the heart. We were recruiting cells to come to that area and repair that tissue. So what we did was we have a, um, this is a little tiny rat tourniquet. So this is a little pneumatic device where we uh, make a tourniquet on a rat limb. So we inflate this and uh, uh, impose the trinket for two hours, then release it. And then at, uh, at 24 hours, we inject our system. So this is our gel with our growth factor loaded. And then we look and see what happens. And what I show you here is that um, this axis is force production, how much force the limb can produce. So the maximum force that that limb is able to produce. So the uninjured uh, rat is able to produce about uh, 25 newtons of force. The injured rat with no treatment is producing about half of that um, at two weeks out. When we treat with our system, we can recover about 75% of the force. So again, we are increasing with this system the healing ability. And if you look at these cross sections, um, the muscle looks a lot better. It has a much more normal, healthy appearance. We looked at mechanism, and again we thought, well, we're recruiting stem cells, and those stem cells lead to healing. But in fact, we didn't see that. What we saw is that this strategy improved the survival of affected cells. It wasn't actually promoting regeneration. It was just limiting damage. It was just limiting the inflammatory damage that comes from constricting that blood flow for so long. And, and so I want to kind of detour a little bit and talk to you a little bit about uh, inflammation and inflammatory injury. So if you accidentally cut yourself, you're chopping food and you cut yourself with a knife, what happens? It's the first thing you notice. Blood, blood's everywhere. So blood comes out, and then what happens? You wash your hands. Good. Why do you wash your hands? To prevent infection. You have all these foreign substances. So there are things on the knife. There's bacteria everywhere. There's all kinds of infectious agents that might get into the wound. And that's what inflammation is for. Inflammation protects us against foreign substances. So bacterial introduction and other foreign substances that might come from a cut, or it, I might uh, inhale them or ingest them. Um, what I want to sort of draw your attention to are there are cells that are involved in this inflammatory process, the cells of the immune system, the white blood cells, particularly macrophages, whose job it is to degrade and digest some of these foreign particles. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But when inflammation happens, all of these bad things happen. So these are the four or five cardinal signs of inflammation. Uh, who took Latin? <coughs> some of you guys. You guys are like, is this going to be a quiz? Rubor, two more, calor, and dolor. Right? Redness, heat, pain, and swelling. These are the hallmarks and sometimes loss of function. These are the hallmarks of inflammation. So when you get a cut, it hurts, right? It becomes red, it swells, uh, and it's hot, right? Those things are bad. Why does that even happen? Let's just skip inflammation. Why do we need it? Well, one of the reasons we need it is because Humans are exquisitely engineered to fight off infection. And one of the reasons that we are designed in such a way, if you look at, this is a graph of number of deaths per 100,000 people 
1900 and the number of deaths in 2010. And what I want to draw your attention to is in 1900, over half of deaths were due to diphtheria, gastrointestinal infections, tuberculosis, and pneumonia or influenza. All infectious diseases. Okay? Prior to you know, modern times, people mostly died of infection. Now, over half the deaths are the two biggies, cancer and heart disease. And I have a little interactive, um, let's see if I can get this going. So it's basically intermission. This is a game from Slate Magazine called, What Would You Have Died Of in 1811? Who wants to play this game? Raise your hand. Yes, what is your name? Austin. All right, let's find out what you would have died of in 1811. Spin the wheel. You would have died of convulsions. <laughs> Who else wants to play? Yes, what's your name? Ben. Um, you want to try 1811 or you want? Okay, we'll try again. Convulsions again. A lot of, a lot of convulsions. Yes. Ty, let's see what you've done. Fever, typhus fever, that is a bacterial infection. Who else? Yes? Jared. Jared, you would have died of consumption. You know what consumption is? Anybody know what consumption is? Tuberculosis. What kind of infection is that? Bacteria. Who else wants to play? Yes? Zach. Zach, what? let's see what you've done. Teething. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yes, what's your name? Melanie. Melanie, you died of typhus fever. Back in the back. Haley. Haley, you died of diseases not mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Unmentionable disease. Yes, right there. Hirsch. You died of convulsions again. All right, I'm going to do a rapid fire session. Lightning, wow. <laughs> Villainous fever, inflammatory fever. Droppy, I don't know what that is. Consumption, which is tuberculosis. Stillborn, pulmonic fever, that's uh, bacterial. Infantile flux, which is a edemic problem. Stillborn fever. All right, so they often didn't know what people were going to die of. Let's see what they die of in 1647. Rickets, God, I don't know what that is. Consumption, <laughs> plague, bloody flux. <laughs> Plague, teeth, yeah, yeah, that's horrible. Okay. In 1990, what are you going to die of? Let's see what we got. Heart disease, closed. You had a 50-50 shot, and you picked wrong. Heart disease, cancer, accidents. Heart disease, cancer, accidents, suicide, heart disease, heart disease, diabetes, heart disease, heart disease, cancer. So you can see that, <coughs> number one, they didn't really have a good handle on medicine uh, prior to 1900. So some people, sometimes people died of things people didn't know what it was. But many of those diseases were infective. And the moral of this story is that the human body developmentally is designed to combat infection. That's what inflammation is for. But when you think about heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, cancer, in, uh, inflammation can be a problem. It can be a problem in trying to, trying to regenerate tissues. All right, that was a good detour. <laughs> so, we look back at our salamander. This is a paper that came out uh, not very long ago, so 2013. And this is something that really impacted my thinking about my research. So what they did is they took this salamander, just like before. So they amputated, this is a four-day stump. And this is what happens at 40 days, so this is the normal events. In this salamander, what they did was they temporarily got rid of all of the macrophages. Again, the macrophages are those inflammatory cells that are there to eat up bacteria and other infected agents. So they got rid of all these macrophages, thinking, well, if you get rid of inflammation, that's got to help repair and regeneration, right? It turns out it absolutely stops regeneration. So all these things that we think are bad about inflammation, 
there's something that's absolutely necessary for coordinating with generation. Both of these animals can be reamputated with their macrophages intact, and they're perfectly able to regenerate. So there's something very important about macrophages. You can't just get rid of macrophages. And so a lot of the understanding about inflammation in the immune system really has to do with macrophage phenotype. Macrophages are not just one thing. There is a whole multitude of phenotypes that macrophages can adopt. And in fact, what's been defined in the literature is that there are bad macrophages, macrophages that result in a big inflammatory response that can damage tissue, and there's good macrophages, macrophages that can be um, coordinating repair and regeneration. And so the bad macrophages are stimulated by things like interferon gamma. The good macrophages are uh, initiated by things like interleukins, and I'll draw your attention to this marker, the CD206 is a marker for sort of the good macrophages. And that's something that we're interested in. So one of the things we began to think about is we began to think about, hey, maybe what stem cells do is they actually control what the macrophages do. Maybe they themselves aren't doing something specific, but maybe they tell the macrophages what to do. And so the first thing we did was we cultured adipose derived stem cells, so stem cells from fat, with macrophages from bone marrow. So this is a measure of macrophage phenotype. Recall that 206 is the good guys, not 206 is the bad guys. And we looked at percent 206 when ASCs were cultured with macrophages. And what we saw is a dramatic upregulation of an M2 phenotype, this good macrophage phenotype, just culturing in the presence of stem cells. And in fact, this was significantly greater than stimulation with IL-4, which is a classic uh, M2 differentiation factor. So what we did was we, uh, again, evaluated it in an animal. This is a mouse model of femoral excision. So we actually take out the femoral artery of a mouse and remove it. And so all the tissue downstream of that artery in the hind limb is uh, robbed of oxygen and blood. So we do our injury at time zero, at day one, we inject either saline, so a control, macrophages, stem cells, or a combination of macrophages and stem cells. And then we evaluate at 21 days. And so what we saw is that um, if we look at the quality of the muscle tissue by, by measuring the myofiber size, the bigger the myofiber, the more healthy the muscle is. So we look at myofiber size, and we looked at force production. So what force could these hind limbs um, produce? And what we saw is that this is the control, so uninjured. This PBS is the saline injured control. So we expect myofiber size to drop off for the injury. And we expect force to drop down for the injury. For the macrophages alone, or stem cells alone, we saw no healing. But when we put them together, we actually saw complete recovery of first production at three weeks, and we saw much better muscle morphology at three weeks. So there's something about those cells actually talking to one another, the stem cells and the cells of the immune system. All right. So this is kind of our big picture understanding. This is kind of how my lab thinks about regeneration right now. <clears throat> These are stem cells. Stem cells, when they're injected into a wound, so the wound is ischemic, it doesn't have a lot of oxygen, it's hypoxic. <coughs> These cells will secrete factors that cause other cells to mobilize to the site, so it recruits a bunch of other cells, like monocytes. Monocytes are the precursor to macrophages. It also controls the angiogenesis response. It recruits blood vessels to the site. But maybe more, most importantly, is that these cells actually control polarization of macrophages towards a pro-regenerative phenotype. So they're actually causing the body's own immune system to become more regenerative, and they're actually protecting the tissue against damage. So this is something that we're very excited about, and one of the things we're doing now 
is getting rid of the stem cells altogether and really focusing on how do we engineer these macrophages? How do we make these macrophages repair tissue themselves? All right, so what did we learn? Well, one of the things we've learned is the body does have an ability to upregulate its regenerative program. There are ways to cause regeneration of damaged tissue in the adult animal. The function of stem cells really depends on their local environment. If you put them into a certain environment, they'll behave differently than in another environment. And it's really important to think about what their environment is. A primary mechanism of adult cell therapy is to modulate inflammation. That is a big role for what stem cells are doing in the clinic and what they can potentially do um, in other applications. Controlling inflammation, we think, is important um, for any therapeutic target. So if we want to control repair, we have to be able to modulate and control inflammation. And with that, what I'm going to do, I know you all have very different courses that you're taking and very different things you're thinking about, but what I thought I'd do is give you some free advice based on the path that I took. So, one of the hallmarks of my path is my area of expertise, biomaterials, polymers, synthetics, is not necessarily where I ended up. So I'm doing a lot of biology now that I never thought I would do. So the first thing I would tell you was really my first lesson as a scientist, which is never compromise your principles. It may seem easy to take shortcuts now, but it will come back and haunt you as an adult. Develop an expertise. That's what you're supposed to be doing right now as an undergrad. You're supposed to be developing an understanding and expertise in some topic. Do that. Think about your long term, and I crossed out goals because I was going to put goals, but I put aspirations because if I ask students usually their goals, they'll have goals like I want to get a 4.0, I want to graduate, you know. And I'm talking about really what do you aspire to do. I want to help people. I want to cure cancer. Nobody says that because it sounds corny. But really think to yourself about what you want to do. I want to be famous. Aspire to something bigger than yourself. And be responsive to new opportunities. If I hadn't responded to what was happening around me scientifically, I would not be doing what I'm doing today. So I have an expertise, I know what I know, I know what I don't know, and those things I don't know, I try to develop collaborations with other people. But I respond to what's happening. I don't just keep doing the same thing my whole career. And this is my little Forrest Gump analogy. I told my kids I was going to put up the Forrest Gump analogy on them, and they're like, what are you talking about? But, you know, there is a little bit of destiny, and there is a little bit of float around accidental like on a breeze. So be responsive, but also have a core of expertise. Um, and figure that out now while you're in college. <laughs> all right, so with that, I'll thank my students. These are the people that do all the lab work, and I love them, I love working.